years. Uh, this was their support, their source of, of um, wood in particular for both Iceland and for Greenland. Uh, it's a lot closer to Greenland to get you wood from uh, North America than it is from Norway. And there is almost no good wood on Iceland. Trees grow to a height of about 12 feet. <laughs> so if you want to good, you know, good, good lumber, you just come to America. So anyway, how, how could possibly Christopher Columbus have discovered America? So I talked about that. And, and then you questioned it. This young African girl uh, said, well, we got the air cap. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, absolutely. And did I think, yeah. And I knew what she was talking about. She said, what, what are we supposed to do with these days? Um, uh, who discovered America? A, B, C, yes, D, E. <laughs> and I thought that was a brilliant question. And I said, well, put Christopher Columbus, but that night write a letter to your state senator. And she liked the answer. <laughs> That sounds like an awesome experience. Um, my personal question, do you come to Boston often? Perfect for graduate school. And um, it, it just happens that just last night, I saw the, shall we say, the Boston movie. And of course, I'm talking about Spotlight. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I, I don't know about Spotlight. Of the big movies of right now. Uh, Spotlight is a movie about how the Boston Globe uh, exposed the sex scandal in the Roman Catholic Church uh, beginning in Boston. Uh, and it's a very good movie about, about hard working journalism. Uh, and, and what's worrying immediately, so you got to see it because it's really about Boston. Mm. Um, it's interesting, there wasn't a single black character in the movie. Uh, because, the, well, I guess because there aren't that many black Catholics, although, you know, I used to live in Mississippi and there's quite a few black Catholics in Mississippi. Um, but there's all these people being preyed upon by priests, these, by people, I mean, eight to 15 year olds, you know. Mm. And um, anyway, so I, I was just uh, enjoying the movie because Boston looks exactly as it did when I went to school there in, in most, of the, most of the city. And it's a beautiful city. I, I love Boston in many ways. Um, of course, when I went there, race relations were much worse than they are now, and I'm sure that they're not perfect now. Absolutely not. We are actually, um, one of the stories that I read this morning as far as news is concerned was talking about how Brookline uh, is treating the police officers, uh, white officers treating black officers, and that's something that they're currently looking into. We have uh, ridiculous gentrification going on throughout the city, so you're absolutely right. Even though Boston may not have the same tensions that we did prior, we still have the same problems. Um, I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, did you question or argue against textbooks? Were you in high school? And shout out to Ashley who asked this question. Yeah, both the questions are good so far. When I was in high school, what did I know? You know, um, I will have to say this. James Owen. <laughs> my high school history text, uh, test, try that again. My high school history course was by far the most boring course of all the courses I had in high school. And this is often true for students. It depends on their teacher, of course. But my teacher was the coach, the basketball coach. And I grew up in central Illinois. And central Illinois is uh, kind of an extension of, shall we say, Larry Bird country. Now, some of you folks are too young to remember Larry Bird. But Larry Bird was a Boston phenomenon, too. But he came up from southern Indiana. And I grew up in central Illinois. And basketball is the number one sport in that whole area. And so you have all these coaches. Uh, you know, you have all these football coaches and basketball coaches, they can't just teach PE classes. There's not enough physical education to go around. So they have to teach something else in high school. Well, we don't want them teaching English. If they teach English, the students will all come up illiterate. Uh, there's no possibility that Coach DeMolin, who was my teacher, could teach math. Uh, even he knew he couldn't do that. So the idea is, let's have him teach something that doesn't matter. Let's have him teach U.S. history. Mm. All he has to do is stay ahead of the kids in the book. And of course, I don't think he even did that. So all we did for the whole year was read the book and answer the 55 questions at the end of each chapter. And then we move on to the next chapter. And the questions are all these, I call them twig questions. We're not asking about the forest. We're not even asking about trees. We're just asking twig questions like, who discovered America? Or Columbus discovered America in 1490, 1492, 1505, 1942, or he never did. Oh, that'd be good if they had that offer in it, wouldn't they? <laughs> but they don't. 
<laughs> so it was just terribly boring, and all I did was read the book. And I never thought about it except to answer those stupid questions. Uh, where did I get better information? Well, I think in my case, I did read a lot as a kid, but I don't remember particularly challenging my book in school. I think it was when I went to college. And especially it was when I went to Mississippi. And my junior year, I spent part of my junior college year abroad, I call it, uh, in the state of Mississippi. Uh, I went to Mississippi State University, which was then segregated and all white. And some people told me this with pride. Some people told me this with chagrin, that it was the largest segregated all white institution of higher learning outside of South Africa. Um, because all other institutions that were bigger in the United States had already, shall we say, caved in. Mm. Uh, Ole Miss had admitted exactly one student, James Meredith, one black student, uh, the previous fall. And so there I was. I went there on purpose just because of that, because <clears throat> I wanted to learn about segregation. And while I was there, I spent several days at each of two black schools, Tougaloo College in Mississippi, and Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, in Alabama. Uh, I think it's the way that I was the first white student in the history of Tuskegee, or at least in the history of Tuskegee in the 20th century. Um, Tougaloo was always integrated. It always had a sprinkling of white students and quite a few white faculty members. So anyway, that was my introduction to race relations, and I did it on purpose because I thought, here I am, a major in sociology, and I don't know anything about anything but the Midwest. How is that competent? I didn't think that was competent. So that's what really got me on the path toward thinking about U.S. history. Mm, thank you for breaking that down for us. I actually answered a few other questions while you were answering that one. Um, I would like to give a huge shout out to um, Gustavo. He asked, what is next for you? What books or projects are you currently working on that we can anticipate later on? That's a good question, too. Um, People need to know that, that I did write a second book that's directly like Lies, and in fact it's called Lies Across America, What My Historic Sites Get Wrong. And it treats different historic sites all across the country. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction um, Plymouth, and uh, Plymouth is full, of, <laughs> is full of lies. It also has some institutions that, that do a much better job, notably this thing called Plymouth Plantation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know mm -hmm. that. Um, but Plymouth Rock is, is just, so Plymouth Rock is the kind of uh, place that I treat in lives across America. I find at least one uh, historical marker or museum or mount monument or whatever the heck it is in every state that is just ridiculous. And some of them are deeply ridiculous and tell us really serious things that are wrong. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I went to President Buchanan's home in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Of course, it's a nice mansion. We all should live there. Um, it's named Wheatlands. And so after that, I decided, well, maybe everybody should name their house, you know. But anyway, you go there, you take a tour. Not very many people go there. He was a terrible president who helped lead to the Civil War. Uh, he, was a, uh, he was in favor of the far out pro-slavery wing of the Democratic Party, and that's why he got nominated for president, and that's why he got elected president in 1856. So you go there, and the very first thing that the man says, giving you the tour is, well, you're not here to talk politics, you're here to see the house. Well, that's not true at all. It's not the finest house in Lancaster. We're here because he was a former president, and he's interesting, and, and so we are here to talk politics, as he put it. So then he gives us a tour of the whole house, emphasizing the silverware, and the wallpaper and the chairs, and we don't learn nothing, no how, about, uh, of, of any use about uh, Buchanan. So when the whole tour is over, see, I don't open my mouth during the tour because I want to see what the average person gets. When the whole tour is over, I ask the shortest question I've ever asked in my life. It only has, I think, eight letters. I said, was he gay? <laughs> now, just for the record, it turns out that he was gay. But the man says he definitely was not and he takes all four of us, there are only four people on this tour, my son and me and one other couple. He takes us up the stairs, the central major stairs in the middle of the house, to the top of the landing where there is an oval frame that has a picture of the girlfriend that he had for several months in his late 20s to whom he was engaged. And this proves, says the guy, that he was not gay. Now, it turns out that she broke off the relationship 
because, in the words of a girlfriend of hers, quote, he did not seem able to show her proper affection. Mm. So this doesn't prove he was not gay. It's another instance of examples that he probably was gay. And in fact, we know for sure he was gay. If you ever want to read Lies Across America, I nail him there. Not that, that gay is a bad thing, um, but it's an important thing. And the reason it's particularly important, it comes to my next question. The next thing I asked him was, um, how, what, the only other thing, how was he on slavery? And he said, he was against it. All the people in this area were. Well, he's right about the area. The area is full of uh, Amish people who are against slavery, Mennonites who are against slavery, and Quakers who are against slavery. And even the First Presbyterian Church of Lancaster was against slavery, and so as a result, it disfellowshipped President Buchanan. That is to say, they removed him from communion because he was so pro-slavery they were disgusted with him. Mm. So we get two direct lies told us by this house, or by the staff at this house, and the two lies turn out to be created, uh, correlated because the, the great love of Buchanan's life, with whom he lived for at least 15 years, was William Rufus King, the senator from Alabama and vice president under uh, the, the previous president, Pierce. Um, and Buchanan thought the world of him. And of course, uh, this guy from Alabama was a slave owner and a member of the far out pro-slavery wing of the Democratic wow. Party. Also, that was the next book I wrote that is right on this subject. So now I'm writing a third book, and it's going to be called something like um, Surprises on the Land, Unexpected Places That Get History Right. Ooh. And there are more and more of these places that actually have made an effort and tell interesting and important stories. Some of them have been telling it for 100 years or more, but nobody stops to read this historical marker or go to this museum. And so I'm going to bring it to life. Mm. Is there one example that you can share with us this rising of um, surprisingly places that got history right? Sure. Let me give you one. Uh, the, the, the one I often give, um, it's about a guy named Edward Coles. Now, I bet you know, have, have you ever heard of Edward Coles? Absolutely not. Yeah, almost nobody has. A few historians have because he briefly had a correspondence with a guy named Thomas Jefferson. And I suspect you have heard of that guy. Of course we have. Yes. So Edward Coles was the son of a slave owner in Virginia. And so naturally he was rich. He was a big slave owner. He went off to college and there he learned uh, what was then being taught stuff about the rights of man. Uh, he read the Declaration of Independence by this guy, Tommy Jefferson. Uh, he read the stuff by uh, philosophers like Locke and Rousseau from France. And he took it seriously. I don't think you were supposed to, but he made the mistake of learning it and taking it seriously, and he thought slavery was wrong. He kind of kept that idea secret from his parents, and pretty soon they endowed him with a plantation and a whole bunch of slaves. Uh, meanwhile, I need to say, uh, after he graduated from college, he became the private secretary of President Madison, because all these rich people in, Matt, in Virginia knew each other, so he had a position almost in the cabinet, even though he was just like 22 years old. Pretty soon he gets his plantation. And he decides to free his slaves. But he doesn't think he wants to, he wants to start a movement. And he doesn't think he can do it all by himself. So he writes Jefferson and he says, Dear President Jefferson, I've been reading this stuff like your Declaration of Independence and I've been taking it seriously and I think slavery is wrong. And I know you do too, because you wrote all men are created equal. Uh, I'm going to free my slaves, but I'm just me, you know. Uh, if you would join me, we could start a real movement. Now, Jefferson by now is an old man. Uh, he's, this is maybe 1815 or so. Um, he writes, but he gets worse and worse on slavery the older he gets. So he writes back saying, oh, no, this is not the right time. God will take care of this problem in his appointed time, blah, blah, blah. So Coles decides to do it anyway. He goes to southern Illinois, which is just newly a state. It becomes a state in 1818. And all the people in Illinois live in southern Illinois. Uh, Indians have lived in, and some, some still do live in northern Illinois, and Chicago's a town of about 50 people. Um, so he goes to southern Illinois, and he buys some land. It's really cheap. He's really rich. He comes back. He tells his slaves, we're going to Illinois. And they go on, they get on two flatboats. They start going down the Ohio River. He can't free them in Virginia and leave them in Virginia because of a law that Tommy Jefferson helped pass that makes it illegal to free slaves in Virginia without getting them out of state because they don't want no free Negroes around as they were called that day. <laughs> so he gets them out of state. And as they go down the river on these flatboats, he tells them, okay, you guys are free. 
Uh, you can get off right now if you want. If I, if, I, if I, you get off to the right, toward the north, not toward the left. And they think he's great. He's their favorite white person ever, and you can see why. And he says, oh, if you want to come with me, come on down to Silver, Illinois. You have to help me clear the land for a few years, and then you can have some. They say, we like you, boss. We're going with you. So they all go into Illinois. And Illinois was so racist at that time that it actually required, if you came in with black folks or if black folks came in by themselves, they had to post a $500 bond assuring their good behavior. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, but $500 then is about the equivalent of $35,000 now. You can think about that. He doesn't post it, and, and nobody catches him. Uh, pretty soon, he decides to run for governor because Illinois is becoming a slave state. Now, nobody in Illinois knows that Illinois tried to become a slave state in about 1822. Did you know that? Absolutely not. I did not. If Illinois had become a slave state, which it almost did, the whole history of this country would have been completely different because you could not have gone west without going through slavery, mm. unless you paddled across Lake Michigan, I guess. Um, and, you know, Kansas almost became a, became a slave state as it was. If Illinois had become a slave state, Kansas would have become a slave state for sure. And, and who knows when or if we might have gotten rid of slavery. Mm. But anyway, so Coles runs for governor. And... There's a majority in favor of slavery. Uh, they see slavery in, in Missouri. They see slavery in Kentucky. They're almost surrounded by slavery. And it's a great system as long as you don't have to be the slave. You know, it's great not to have to pay your worker. Uh, so uh, more than two thirds of the votes go for pro-slavery candidates, but, uh, but not more than almost two thirds of the votes because it's a three-way election and there's no runoff. And so Coles comes in first by 52 votes. Meanwhile, the second place guy and the third place guy are both pro-slavery. If there had been a runoff, he would have been swamped. So he becomes governor. Meanwhile, the legislature that gets elected is overwhelmingly pro-slavery, and they pass a constitutional amendment to make Illinois a slave state. All it has to do then is get a majority of the vote of the people. And since two-thirds already elected them, that looks like a sure thing. Mm -hmm. But Cole starts stumping the state against slavery. He is still rich, so he buys the leading newspaper in the state, which just happens to go bankrupt at that time, and it was pro-slavery. And he makes it into an anti-slavery organ, and as a friend of Cole says, he seemed to take particular delight in sending it to its former subscribers. He's quite a guy, don't you think? <laughs> so meanwhile, the opposition burns him in effigy at the state capitol in Vandalia. But they don't do it right, and by accident, they catch the cattle on fire and cause hundreds of dollars in damage, and probably thousands of dollars in today's terms. So they look like a bunch of hoodlums, and partly because of that mistake, and partly because of Coles's work, slavery goes down to defeat by 5446, and Illinois stays a free state. Now, that's a serious story, and nobody learns it even in Illinois. I went to Coles County, Illinois, which is, of course, named for Edward Coles, I went to the county seat, which is Charleston, Illinois. I went to the high school. I talked with two classes combined, the journalism class com together with the U.S. Uh, the Advanced Placement U.S. History course. Now I'm talking with 50 of the leading students in juniors and seniors at this high school. I asked them, who is Edward Coles? Well, they all knew that the county was named for him. They all figured out that he must have been male, he must be dead, and he must have been white. They're not stupid. And that's all they knew. They never not, they did not know one sentence about Coles. Well, it turns out that on the centennial anniversary, 18, 1923 or 24 maybe, of the defeat of slavery in Illinois, the state put up this terrific big historical marker on a little road near where Coles lived in south, southwestern Illinois. Nobody sees it. Everybody drives right past it. Nobody knows anything about this story. And it's an important story. It, I mean, it teaches us, among other things, that abolitionists sometimes won. Uh, it teaches us, among other things, that not all white folks were racist. It teaches us also that slavery was pretty popular in the North. So that's an example of what's going to be in my new book. Mm. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really hate that we have so limited time with you. Uh, this is the last question from a teacher, then I have a personal question that I would like to ask. Recently, colleges and other institutions have been confronting their complex in moral past, particularly with regard to race. Students at universities such as Princeton, as well as Harvard, are advocating for renaming of buildings on their campuses. Do you think that renaming buildings, streets, and schools is a step in the right direction? And what do you think is the best for a the best way for present day institutions to reckon with the past histories? Another good question. Um, I think it depends on the person to some extent. Um, and um, I'll give you an example. Um, Jefferson High School, there's a lot of Jefferson High Schools. Uh, and let's compare him to, uh, well, right near, right, right near me, I, I'm in Washington, D.C., uh, there's the, the number one highway is Route 1, which incidentally comes right through Boston, too. U.S. 1 goes all the way from Maine to Florida. And it goes near you and it goes near me. And when it leaves south of here, as soon as it crosses the Potomac River, it gets called uh, the uh, Jefferson Davis Highway. And the Jefferson Davis Highway goes from Alexandria, Virginia, all the way down through places in Virginia where Jefferson Davis was, winds its way down through Mississippi, where, of course, Jefferson Davis grew up and where he was a, a senator from. And then, for almost no reason at all, it goes clear over to California and up to Seattle and hits the, the um, Canadian border north of Seattle. Okay? So that's the Jefferson Davis Highway. Now, Jefferson High School, uh, which there's lots of, in fact, there's one in uh, Oregon, um, is named for Thomas Jefferson. We know Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Furthermore, despite claims to the contrary, he was an average slave owner. He was not an above average slave owner. There was no such thing as a good slave owner, except I think we have to say Coles was a wonderful slave owner because he gave up his slaves, freed them. Um, but Jefferson never did any such thing. Uh, we know that Jefferson had sex with at least one slave, now whether that was quasi-consensual or uh, we don't know. It couldn't exactly have been consensual because she was a slave. But that's not what he's famous for. He's famous for uh, buying the Louisiana purchase from, from France, in other words, doubling the size of the United States as far as European powers were concerned. He still, we still had to take it from its original owners. Uh, he's famous for writing the Declaration of Independence, at least. Uh, he's famous for being president for eight years. I think we should leave Thomas, and Jeff uh, Thomas Jefferson High School alone. We should maybe put a plaque on it saying he's got a mixed record. You don't tell the goods and the bads about mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson. But what about um, Jefferson Davis Highway? Well, first of all, it doesn't even tell us any history just to name it for him. I think it should be renamed. Uh, second of all, he is famous for, and the highway is named for him simply because he was the president of the Confederacy, which, after all, seceded and committed treason on behalf of slavery. I mean, that's what it did, to, to be blunt about it. So I think a lot of things need to get renamed, and I think it's great that colleges are considering this, and some of them had even been doing it years ago. In fact, some of the entries in Lies Across America, uh, one of, I mean, uh, surprises in my new book, surprises in my uh, uh, on the landscape. One of the entries is going to be about the University of Oklahoma, which renamed a building maybe 10 years ago because it was named for a leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, that I didn't know. Well, there's all kinds of buildings across America named for leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, he wasn't only the Ku Klux Klan head. He also started the chemistry department. Uh, so they renamed it Chemistry Building. And they put a plaque up right next to the uh, front door saying this building used to be named so-and-so hall so-and-so was the leader of the chemistry department he did the following but he was also the president the head of the Ku Klux Klan statewide in Oklahoma and he did this stuff so in other words they're clear about it and they tell more history than a lot of people say well we can't be named history we well, you're just you're just trying to whitewash history no to name a building for somebody doesn't just teach history. It mostly teaches, we really think great of this guy. He was great and should be honored. Well, there's a question about that. Uh, right in your neighborhood in Cambridge, Agassi Middle School, named for Louis Agassi, A-G-A-S-S-I-Z, -S -S looks like Agassi, um, got renamed maybe 10 years ago because of a student-led protest because Agassi was infamous for uh, racist theory of evolution 
uh, wasn't exactly evolution, in which blacks were uh, created separately from whites and worse, and were, you know, it was a completely racist theory that, that they were the bottom of humanity and white folks were the top of humanity. Now, Agassi did some other things. He was a geologist. Uh, and he did live in, and he was taught at Harvard, and he did live in Cambridge. But uh, they renamed it, and what I'm hoping they do, and I don't know if they've done this, is put a plaque up on the building again, saying, it used to be named the Agassi School. Here's what Louis Agassi did in all of his glory and in all, all of his racist mistakes. Mm, I really hope so, too. Uh, we also have other streets in Boston, Cambridge, Brookline that are named after some people that we shouldn't really be proud that they're named after. My last question, because it's 7 a.m., we're currently out of time, and hopefully we'll be able to have you back sometime in the future. I know, I know. <laughs> But my question is, so right now in society, one of the biggest things that we're dealing with is the white supremacy or white privilege. And I feel, I don't have facts behind this, but I feel like what we're learning in school and what's being taught in school is creating this huge vacuum of white privilege. And it's... Is that, get to your question, I'm sorry. How do... Uh, Jim, how do we reverse this? Like, how do we... Making progress. In fact, everything we've talked about this morning uh, speaks to that. Uh, it's exactly white privilege that allows us to name all these buildings for uh, for Columbus. Uh, you know, we got Columbus, Ohio. We got District of Columbia. We got, you know, etc. Now, again, Christopher Columbus did do some stuff that wasn't related to uh, white supremacy, although much of what he did was related to white supremacy. So I'm not saying we got to name it district or something else, um, but we need to have a, a all over the country accurate pl places that give you the truth. And we need to, what I'm trying to get done right now is take down Confederate monuments and Confederate flags mm. and not just destroy them. Uh, what I'm trying to get Baltimore to do, for instance, and, and uh, they may do it, uh, is they've got a whole bunch of them. They've got at least five Confederate monuments in Baltimore and one really U.S. monument. Isn't that interesting? Baltimore didn't even secede, um, but it went Confederate in about 1900, if you will. Uh, so we've got to get them taken down. I, I'm arguing, put them in a park, put them all together, let them talk to each other, and put up a bunch of historical markers around them that tell why they went up around 1900, how that was a very racist period of American history. And... Um, so people will go there and they will learn from them, just like people can go to certain places in Eastern Europe and learn from all the Stalin and Lenin statues that have been taken down from where they were in places of glory and put in a park and uh, they can talk to each other. Mm, mm, mm. So when your book has all of these facts, uh, but yet our history books still tell all of these lies, lies how and when and please tell me the steps in which I need to take in order to place these truths that you have uncovered into these books that are going into being pumped into our schools. Well, I, you know, when I published, when I wrote Lies My Teacher Told Me, I did not expect that it would cause the textbook publishers to shape up. And one reason I didn't is because um, a somewhat similar book, at least it was a book critical of textbook, came out 15 years before mine, uh, back in the eight, 1980s, uh, and it made fun of textbooks for some of the stupid things they did. Uh, it, it didn't uh, focus on race like my book does. It didn't focus actually on content, but it made fun of them for other things. And the textbook just continued, even though this book got serialized in the New Yorker and most of the textbook publishers are in New York. So I didn't think it would change the publishers. But by gosh, it is changing how a lot of teachers teach history. And there's all kinds of teachers all across the United States in public school systems in Massachusetts and, uh, and everywhere who uh, hold up my book at the beginning of, class, of the year and say, all right, you don't have to get this and read it because I can't assign you a book, but this is what we're going to be studying in addition to the textbook. And sometimes even there are school districts that even require teachers to show that they have read my book before they will let them teach U.S. history. Uh, so the teaching of U.S. history is slowly getting undermined by the truth. And if we just leave the textbooks alone but have teachers who can teach against them, who can get students saying, ooh, look what it says, 
you know, it doesn't even mention slavery when it treats people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and Andrew Jackson. That's an outrage. And, and then writing letters, as one class did to the publisher, saying, how come you didn't do a better job? Uh, then that's, that's even a better way, really, of learning truth in history than if you had a textbook that was quite accurate, but you just learned it by rote. Mm, mm. J James W. Lowen, I want to personally thank you. Uh, if you could please give a huge shout out to the Boston Community Leadership Academy for they, uh, the students in 10th grade, have read your book. And um, some of these questions came from the, those students, Boston Community Leadership Academy. Well, every single question I got was a darn good one. So somebody's thinking up in Boston. <laughs> well, I, I thank you, Jim. And hopefully uh, sometime in the future when uh, the stars align, we'll be able to have you back on because we, I can't tell you how many questions are coming in, but we're so strapped for time. But I do thank you. I love you. And we appreciate all of your hard work over the years. And please let us know when you're in Boston so we can come and see you. And let me just say, if, if every person listening would get a copy of Lies My Teacher Told Me, read it, keep it nice, don't mark in it, take notes on the side, and then give it to their middle school or high school history teacher, we'll, we'll progress. Mm, did you guys hear that? He said that we have to take action. <laughs> it just doesn't happen by you thinking that it's going to change. We have to take action. Jim, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have an amazing day today. All right, how you guys, how you feeling kings and queens? I know that there were plenty of questions that came in that we were unable to get through, but the energy alone, the truth alone, it rings and it vibrates and the zetting, I feel it, don't you feel it? We have to be active. You have to be active. You cannot think for five seconds that your children are going to learn the truth and you're not the one teaching them. You cannot think for a second that you can send these babies to school and they are going to get the knowledge they're supposed to. If you can get the book, you read the book and you can decode these lies for yourself and help your child, help yourself get a better understanding of the lies that are perpetuating our system. The fact that we even have white privilege comes from the fact that these institutions are teaching these lies across America. I'm so excited. I am so thankful to have James W. Lowen on air. He's such a great storyteller. I would have loved to have him for a history teacher. I think I may have actually done well in history had I had a teacher like him telling me the truth and opening my eyes to everything. We are blessed. We are so blessed to have had him on. I love you. I thank the Boston Community Leadership Academy. Uh, I thank the listeners. I appreciate you all. Big City, waking up with Taylor Andre, Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. to 7. Don't forget we got Zoe Williams in the building. Zoe what? Zoe what on Thursday? Mwah! Yep, try baby, you know what it is, it's DJ Sus1, the feature presentation. Listen, make sure you wake up with Taylor Andre, Monday through Friday, 5 to 7 a.m. on Big City 101.3 FM. Wake up with the Radio Rebel, politics, news, conspiracies. Wake up your third eye with unorthodox conversations leading to universal consciousness. This is the type of stuff I'm into, all right? Make sure you tune in. Let's go. The champ is here! The champ is here. The champ is here. The champ is here. The champ is here. Champion Dial. Big City 101.3, where we do things very big and bold. It's the Mitch K. Roll Sweet Janice, love your nannies. It's the 80s. Skate and drop a dance Sunday. January 17th, 2016, a beer until at Shameful Roller Rink. You ain't know how it's going. Hallelujah. Ashe, Ashe. Thank you, ancestors. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Good rising, good rising. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you had any other questions for Jim Lowen, we will have him back. When? I don't know, but we will. Um, how blessed are we? <laughs> how blessed are we? I am so excited. And I did have so many more questions, but we were limited for time. So I had to work with what I had. And I don't know if you could tell, but I was shaking the whole time. I do believe that we are making changes. I think it's very slow. I think we are progressing. But it, it, it takes more people to take action. Like it's, it's not just going to happen. Like we're not going to wake up and everything's going to be the way that we want it, need it to be. We have to take action. We have to educate some of these 22-year-olds that are teaching our children that have no clue, who have no idea about history. I love you. I appreciate you. I hope you guys have an awesome day. Zoe Williams, Zoe what? Calling in on Thursday. Very excited for that. And tomorrow we're playing Rhymantic. So we're going to be in a building rapping <laughs> educationally. Thank you.